Good morning and welcome to Church of the Rock. I'm glad you could join us here this Sunday morning. Uh, We're going to be starting a brand new series. We're going to be taking a look at Joseph. He's a character from the book of Genesis in a series that I've titled Long-Term Faithfulness. Long-Term Faithfulness. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 37, but what I'd like to do before we get there is I'd like us to open up in prayer. And this week specifically, I'd like to ask you as a congregation, for those of you who are members here, and even for those of you who are just joining us online, uh, to keep those who are in the healthcare profession, uh, especially those who are attached to our body, I'd like you to keep them in prayer throughout this week. So I'm going to toss out some names to you. If you just want to write a couple of them down and just make sure that they're uh, in your focused prayer this week, that will be uh, greatly beneficial for them, and I'm sure it will be a blessing. Uh, Lee and Verlaine Edwards, uh, Tanya Storms, Keala King, Patty Ede, Cece Mary Pipes, Jen Armstrong, Trish Ellis, Kevin King, and Crystal Whiting. Now, those are just a few of the people that we, we know that are working in the health field and are dealing with the issues that we have on a daily basis. So why don't we go into prayer before we enter into the message this morning and get into the word. Father, we are just very thankful that we can come before you this morning. Thankful, Lord, that you allow us to be able to bring our burdens to you and lay them at your feet. Thankful, Lord, that you can encourage us as well, even in the midst of the confusion and the, and the unsettledness that we have And that you give us a a reason for being and you give us a purpose, Lord, in the midst of all that. And one of them is prayer. Uh, There's a lot of things that we can do, but we really shouldn't be doing anything, Father, unless we lift up these people before you in prayer. And we should be asking you to be watching over them. So, Lord, we want to take some time this morning and we want to thank you for for every one of these people that we've named. Uh, Lord, for the work that they do, for the fact that they are on what is essentially the front line of a battle against the disease that is, is really doing a number on, on our country in this world. I pray your protection over them. Lord, I pray your encouragement for them uh, each and every day as they go to work and they see different things and they have to handle different things. I pray, Lord, that you would bring encouragement and peace to their hearts. For Lee and Verlaine, Lord, I ask that you would just watch over them. For Tanya, Lord, for Patty and Cece and Mary and Jen, Lord, I pray that you would just keep them in your care, that you would watch over them and that you would protect them. Lord, for Keala, that you would encourage her today, uh, most especially, Lord, that your name would be glorified in her life, that she would just be settled before you, Father, in a way that just uh, brings her joy and brings her peace and comfort for her dad, Kevin, as well, and for Trish and Crystal and for Jen, Lord. And we pray that you would just bless them. We thank you for them and for countless others, Lord, who are nameless, Um, to us, but somebody knows who they are. Behind every number is a name, and behind every name is a story. And that story includes families and friends and and people that are having to sit at home concerned about those who go into hospital and they get into ambulances and they do the things that they need to do each and every day uh, for our safety and for our protection. Father, we thank you for them. We thank you that you've gifted them specifically to do those things. And we ask, Lord, that you bless them abundantly and their families as well. Encourage their families with a sense of peace that, Lord, in your providential care, that you have got them under control, Lord, and in the, in the palm of your hand. Thank you, Lord, for them all. I thank you for the opportunity to lift them up to you, for, for every one of them that are working in the medical field. Lord, we give you this beautiful day, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless it, that you would open up your word for us this morning, and that we would hear your voice Uh, Not just my voice, Lord, but we would hear your voice through the scriptures that are read and through the words that are spoken. Father, we just want to lift up the name of Jesus and we want to know what it is we can do, most especially in a time like this, uh, to impact our country, to impact our community, to impact our world, Lord, and just bring glory to the name of Jesus, all for the benefit of your kingdom. Father, we thank you that we are in a time like this and we can be used by you uh, for good. Uh, encourage us in that way, Lord. And that may we encourage one another as well in that way. And we just give you thanks. So now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts this morning as we go into your word be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be starting this morning reading in Genesis chapter 37. I've entitled the message, The Family. God uses anybody. And we're going to be reading down through verse 17 to start. As I said, it's going to take quite a few weeks for us to unpack this beautiful story of grace and of God's sovereignty. 
But going into the text of scripture, we, we read Genesis 37 and starting in verse 1. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing his flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we are binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasture in the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing their flock? And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. This is God's word. Father, may you just take this time, open our hearts and our minds. Show us yourself. Lord, show us our Savior, Jesus, and Show us ourselves and the things that we need to learn and take away from this in the midst of this story. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Again, the title this week is The Family, God Uses Anybody. And what I want us to just kind of unpack as we sit together this morning is things like dysfunction, jealousy, favoritism, immaturity, all key ingredients in this family that we're going to learn And the focus throughout this series as we unpack this story is to see how God takes worldly messes like this and transforms them into divine blessings. And some of the things that we're going to notice are God's grace and his sovereignty over the things that happen in our lives. Too often, people look at the Bible or they come to the Bible with a certain assumption or certain preconceived notions of what they're going to find there when they open up the pages. Sometimes already deciding before they even open the book and even before they arrive at a story that they already know what it says. Or at least the thought that it's a book just full of rules given by this mean and angry God who's somewhere up in the sky. That the characters that you find here in this book and on the pages, like Joseph, for example, are somehow these perfect godly characters who were chosen because they brought something to the table that God could use. But the reality is far different than that. And to me, it's far more encouraging if we want to look at it that way. Not because it's fun to read about somebody else's brokenness and somebody else's dysfunction. That's not the case. Rather, I find hope in the fact that God takes such brokenness that we have in this world and even in our own lives, and he uses it all the time for his glory and for our gain. And I wanted this week, at least as we take a look at this story, to take some time to build the foundation of what will be our journey with Joseph over the weeks ahead. He's a character found in the very first book of the Bible in Genesis. And asking some very important questions that we can and should address prayerfully as we unpack this. I think it's important for us to look at some things. Because it's often said also that when we read the scriptures correctly, we end up finding that all roads end up leading to Jesus. And that too we're going to find to be very true in this story, even though he isn't mentioned. We can see where the Holy Spirit is at work and where this points to Jesus and the work that Jesus did on the cross. 
And as I started to study for this series in, in the weeks past, the important question that I began to wrestle with, and there's going to be more as we unpack in the weeks ahead, I wrote some down in order for us to focus on them. We'll take a look at one this week, but we're going to take a look at them throughout this study. And, and number one is this. What do we do when everything seems to go against us? What do we do when everything seems to go against us? Number two, where is God in the midst of all of that? And the third question that I came up with was, does God really love us and care for us? And you'll understand that question when we dig into this story. And number four, how do we respond when it seems as though God is not watching over us or is even there caring about what it is we're going through in this life? All of these questions need to be unpacked in light of this Joseph, as well as what it is Jesus did for us on the cross. And now for some of us, we're going to come to the story and we're going to have read this before and we're going to understand what we're going through. And many of you have probably walked through this story at least once or twice. And some of you perhaps are coming to this having never even heard about who this Joseph is, except perhaps through the eyes of our kids' church stories or a story being told to you at some point in your life. But either way, either way, as we grow together, as we look at this, as a community of believers, as followers of Jesus, and perhaps even as someone who's just investigating who this Jesus of Nazareth is, we have to understand, and I want to challenge you, you all have something to learn, no matter how many times you've visited this story. I learn something every time I come back to this and I read through it. So never think that you've been there, never think that you've done that, never think that you've read this and you understand it. Even before we get to Joseph, I think one of the most important things we need to do is give a little bit of backstory. Most especially about his dad, a guy by the name of Jacob, where the chapter opens up. He was far from perfect in every sense of the word. If there was a way he could do something wrong, he would. With the help of his own mom as a young boy, he deceived his father in order to get the birthright blessings. And you'll find that in Genesis 27 in the first 30 verses. I take the time to read that. It's an interesting read. As he grows up and he gets himself a wife, he ends up deceiving his father-in-law. And then he sneaks away in the middle of the night with his wives, with his flock, with his kids, and all of his servants and everything that he can can take with him. In Genesis 29 through 31 is where you find that part of Jacob's story. Now on his way back to his brother, he fears his own brother for the things that he's done wrong. And he sends a gift ahead of him with his servants instead of going himself, creating a buffer between his brother and himself just in case his brother was going to do him some harm. He sent his servants out instead. And it was on that very night before Jacob went to bed, after he had sent his servants out with an offering of uh, part of his flock, that he had had an encounter with God. And it was one that would change Jacob's life forever. In Genesis 32, starting in verse 24, Jacob was left alone, and a man was wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. And he had spent his life deceiving people. It was something that Jacob did very well, even lying to his own father about who he was. So I don't find it accidental at all that before God blesses this man, he challenges him with that question, what is your name? You see, Jacob has to come to grips with who he actually is, and he has to identify himself as Jacob, not as somebody else. So he asks him that question, what is your name? There's no blessing that's going to come unless you're honest. Jacob, the deceiver, no, no, that's not who you're going to be known as anymore. You're going to be known now as Israel, as one who strives with God. You see, the man who had lied to his father, who had deceived all kinds of people in God's goodness, is blessed. Why is that? Oh, that's grace. That's the grace of God. Even when we can't get it right, even when we are intentionally getting it wrong at times, when we lie and when we sin and when we do things we know we shouldn't. God, in his grace, blesses us. We see that right here in this story. Now, 
one of the things we do have to understand is that doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want, whenever we want, because God is just going to bless us anyway somehow. That's not the way it works. And Paul the Apostle makes that very clear in his letter to the Romans when he says in chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? You see, the entire reason for God's grace is so that we can walk in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way that we've always been. You see, part of the problem that we struggle with and that we see in Jacob here in these early chapters of Genesis is that we are actually made new in Christ when we come to him. But we are still, in every real sense of the word, we are still us. He hasn't changed us as human beings. Our personalities, our mannerisms, our responses and our behaviors in different situations, they come with us when we walk into a new relationship with Jesus. Being a new creation in Christ doesn't take that stuff away. It's still who we are. The reality is, is if I was a real big jerk before I came to Jesus, there's a very strong possibility that I'm going to be a big jerk after. That doesn't change. I'm just a saved and sanctified jerk. I have to figure out how to make that work in a new way of being. The Bible says that I have to put that to death. I have to bring that into submission to the new way of living and the new way of being human because I am being conformed to the likeness of Jesus. And that takes a lifetime. In fact, it's only going to be complete when you and I are actually seeing Jesus face to face. But until then, We work out our salvation with fear and with trembling, Paul tells us. We walk in unity. We walk in love. We walk in gentleness. We walk in humility. And we walk in patience. And sometimes that means we have to put to death things in ourselves that we would rather not, but we know it is for the betterment of the community we're in. And why is that? Well, we're all just broken clay pots. Every one of us are broken clay pots in the hands of the master potter. We're saved by his grace and we're sent out into the world with purpose, gifted in different ways to do the things we're supposed to do. And that makes for a great story, doesn't it? I think that makes for a wonderful story. Yeah, but sometimes no. Sometimes it doesn't. Because in working all of these things out, I think if we're honest with ourselves, as Jacob had to discover, mistakes are made along the way. We don't always get it right. We aren't perfect. And sadly, mistakes that affected the entire family and the entire nation, in fact. We're going to learn that as well. And it's one of the reasons I love this story of Joseph. And yeah, we are finally back to Joseph. But his story gives me hope. His story really stirs my heart and it encourages me because in all of the brokenness that we're going to discover, in all of the dysfunction that you see within this family, God himself says, this is the group. This is the group that I'm going to use to bless others. I don't need to find somebody who's perfect. I don't need to find somebody who walks on water. I'm going to take broken humanity and I'm going to launch them on a mission to fix broken humanity. And you see, that is the beauty of the Bible. That's the beauty of the story of God. It hides absolutely nothing. Everything is right there on the pages. Now, what that means, we're going to have to settle this out in our hearts and in our minds, is that there are parts of this book and parts of this story, in fact, which are very hard to see and very hard to deal with in all of its ugliness, in all of its deceitfulness, and in all of its brokenness. But they are there on the pages of Scripture for our benefit not just so that we can read a bad story and go, man, I'm glad I'm not as bad as they are. See, it didn't hide the brokenness and the dysfunction that was there. Instead, it revealed it. And it did so in such a way to show us the fragility and God's grace in the midst of broken human beings trying to figure out what they're to do in life. But right away, when we unpack this, we see the manipulative behavior of our friend Joseph, the main character in this story, and the mistakes of his father Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old, Genesis 37 and verse 2 says, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the sons of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. Dad had his favorite. 
And everybody knew that dad had his favorite. And that's not a good way to start. And Joseph had the coat to prove it. And I'm sure, given the, the attitude that we see within this chapter, he wore it around as his badge of approval. Now, I can't imagine that made for good family dynamics on any given day. When you read verse 4, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, and they couldn't speak peacefully to him. It's an encouraging story so far, isn't it? I, I think about it. Any of you who have siblings think on this. Do you ever think mom or dad had a favorite? I just think on that for a minute. I, maybe it was you that was the favorite. It doesn't make it better. It just makes it easier and much more fun for you. But it doesn't make it right. You see, and that's okay until they get you alone and they lock you in the closet or they shove you in the trunk of the car. And then at dinner, they pretend they don't have any idea where it is you are. You see, playing favorites is a very dangerous thing for many reasons. The two that impact our story this morning are that his brothers hated him which is going to set the stage for a key life event that we're going to unpack next week. And Joseph himself, knowing that he's dad's favorite, is just a little bit cocky and arrogant before his older brothers. Now you add to that this sprinkling of immaturity and you've got some serious problems in the midst of this family. Why why is that? Well, Joseph has this dream because God gives him a dream, which he should have kept his mouth shut about, but he didn't. He just had to go tell his brothers what it was that God showed him. And this particular dream, we discover, is going to take a lifetime of trial before it comes to pass, and we understand what it's all about. But he shares it with his brothers nonetheless, making for a wonderful conversation. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. It's like a scene from a play. That makes him even more mad. Verse 8, his brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more. Seems like Joseph's having fun with this for his dreams and for his words. He doesn't seem to be bothered by the fact that they don't like him, that less and less each day they want to be around him. Now, not one to rest on his laurels. He wanted to make sure that he was just pushing this in even more because humility was not exactly a character trait that he had at this moment. Joseph had another dream, and he shares that one as well. I don't know about you, but to be 17 again and all-knowing and all-intelligent and having all the answers for everything is probably not a place that I would want to be. He says in verse 9, Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, there was sun, the moon, the 11 stars were all bowing down before me. Ah, Well, we know where this is going. We know where this is going. But except this time, he doesn't have just his brothers there. He loops his dad in as well because he wants his dad to hear this whole thing. But when he told it to his fathers and to his, to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow down ourselves to the ground before you? You're pouring a little salt in the wound. Let's bring mom and dad into this whole thing. Jacob doesn't like his son's arrogance, and he tries to put him in his place. But it's here in the story where we start to see the dysfunction really begin to show. Really? Now think about this. I mean, as if it hasn't already shown already, we're starting to see it really work itself out. It has, but two things are really important for us to see in verse 11. His brothers were jealous of him, and his father kept, saying, kept this saying in mind. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, his brothers were getting more and more angry every time Joseph talked to them, and they were becoming jealous of him, and his father didn't speak a word about it. He simply kept all of his thoughts in his head. Now, Jacob could, and Jacob absolutely should have addressed Joseph in front of his brothers. That was his job because he was the dad, and Joseph was being an arrogant little twerp. And he should have been put in his place in front of his brothers, but he wasn't. His father kept his mouth quiet. Even if the dream was true, and it was, we're going to discover, to rub it in the face of his brothers over and over and over again, and then rub it into his father's face as well, is wrong, it's disrespectful, and it's absolutely immature. So for Jacob to say nothing actually validated this dysfunctional and misbehavior, and he reinforced the truth to his brothers that dad always did like you best. You've always been his favorite. It seems you can get away with whatever it is you want. 
Uh, well, now the last time a brother got mad in the scriptures, let's think on this for a minute. The last time a brother got mad in the scriptures at this point, it didn't end well either. If you go back to Genesis chapter 4, and I leave that with you to read, you find the story of Cain and Abel. And it's another sad story of jealousy and anger. And that jealousy and anger wasn't brought into submission underneath God's authority. But do you see, though, why this story is so great? In my mind, I think it's wonderful. If God can use this group of people, he can use anybody. There's nobody beyond his reach. None of us is so far gone that we are too far gone for God to use in his world. You are loved in and in spite of your brokenness. And don't let anybody tell you any different. You are loved in and in spite of your brokenness. And God can and he will use you in this world. If you submit to him and you say to him, yes, Lord, I am willing. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for obedience. He's looking for an open heart and a willing heart to hear what he has to say to be taught, to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus, to be willing to do the things that God has gifted you to do. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for perfection. He'd be looking for a long time if he kept looking at us. But you see, sadly, much like Cain, Joseph's brothers first thought when they saw him coming their way was a real bad thought. Verses 18 to 20, they saw him from afar and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. There's an exciting way in which to meet your brother in the field. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Now, we need to think about this for a minute. This attitude of his brothers didn't happen overnight. It didn't come about in that very moment. Not at all. This was the outworking of years of dysfunction, of jealousy, mistrust, and favoritism. You top all of that off with the frosting of Joseph's immaturity, which had gone unchecked and unaddressed by his father, creates a perfect storm. Which leads to one of the questions that I talked about at the beginning. Where is God in the midst of all of this? And that question could be asked by many of us today if we were to sit back and think on our situation. Because sometimes the situation that we are in is all too familiar to this one, isn't it? Well, I can tell you where God is. God's right smack in the middle of it. He's right in the middle of this situation. He's right in the middle of your situation. And how do I know that? Well, his name is Reuben. That's how I know. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let's not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he may rescue him out of their hand to restore him to their father. You see, as bizarre as this seems, as bizarre as this story is, God takes worldly messes and he turns them into divine blessings. Reuben was doing everything he could to save his brother. So it was better to put him in a pit in the ground than it was for his brothers to kill him. And we'll unpack that next week because that doesn't happen overnight either. And we're going to learn that as we continue on in this story. But we have to understand something that's important for us in the midst of this. A lifetime of faithfulness, even in the face of trial after trial after trial, is rewarded with God working all of it out. And instead of being killed as his brothers wanted, or saved as his oldest brother Reuben had hoped and tried, he sold into slavery. He sold into slavery sent into exile, all according to God's plan and God's will. How peacefully unsettling is that? Let's ponder that for a minute. This doesn't seem like God is anywhere involved at all in this situation. And yet he is right in the middle of it. That's peacefully unsettling to me. Welcome to the perfect people of God and his story of redemption. Now, I, I want to leave you with some homework, uh, which is just a habit that I have. Uh, and then I want to read a quote to you from Derek Kinder. My suggestion to you this week, in the midst of all of your time that you may or may not have, I think it would be good if you were to begin to read Genesis 37 through 50 over the course of the next week and the weeks ahead so you can get some background and get your hands around what it is we're going to be looking at. 
And in doing so, prayerfully ask God to show you the things that he did and the things that he wants to do now in and through you. Not just what he did then, but the things that he can do now in and through you. And I leave you with this quote by Kinder when he talks about this particular event. So this train of events that leads Israel into Egypt is set in motion through the rivalries and predicaments of the 12 brothers under the hand of God. The story is a locus classicus of providence. It also exhibits, as Stephen was to show, and Stephen is from the book of Acts, a human pattern that runs through the Old Testament to culminate at Calvary, at the cross of Jesus. The rejection of God's chosen deliverers through the envy and unbelief of family members of kith and kin. Yet rejection which is finally made to play its own part in bringing about their very deliverance. In other words, this story, like all of the Bible, points us to Jesus and the redeeming work of the cross. That were it not for the anger, the resentment, the bitterness in the acts of Joseph's brothers to get him to Egypt, he will be the one who delivers them. And we'll learn that as well. He'll deliver them from famine and starvation. But the reality is, is that much like all of the Bible, this story points us to Jesus and how God uses all of us in every way in our life, even in our brokenness, to bring about his plan of saving the world through the one who died for us and calls us to himself. I think that that's a a wonderful start to the story that we're going to be looking at. But for now, we're going to leave Joseph in the pit and the brothers trying to figure out how to explain to his father why it is he's disappeared. Until next week, why don't we just close in prayer? Father, as we just come before you, I pray that you would just seal up our hearts before you. You would bring comfort to us, Lord, and you would help us to understand the things that you've got going on here in this story of Joseph. I pray, Father, that as we unpack this story ourselves in our quiet time this week, that you would show each and every one of us what it is you're doing, that you would show us your grace and your mercy that is poured out upon these people. Father, that you would show us your sovereign hand in the midst of this very dysfunctional story that seems like nothing good could come out of it. But unbelievably at the end, such wonderful things show. Father, I pray that you would seal this up in our hearts, that you would help our minds to think through these things, that you would encourage us in Christ to just be asking you to show us what it is we can be doing so that we can be more like him and we can understand the growth of Joseph, the redemption of his brothers, and the settling of an entire nation in the very place that God said they would need to be in order that he could deliver them. Just such a beautiful story, Lord. Help us to know that. I pray for everybody who opens up the Bible this week that you would just soften their heart. You would open their mind. Holy Spirit, that you would speak to them and you would just teach them and you would encourage them. Thank you for everybody here today who's watching, Lord, that you would just give them an encouraging word that they need as we just navigate day to day in each thing that we have in front of us, Father, that we would bring glory to your name. We thank you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.